have um, the supremacy of uh, one of software that is called MATLAB. And um, yeah, okay, I'll tell the story a little bit uh, between these, these two things. But I won't talk a lot about MATLAB. <clears throat> Okay, so first let me introduce myself. I'm a physicist uh, from Argentina. Uh, I did uh, my master's in physics, I guess, applied physics, so I haven't yet found the exact equivalent in Argentina. It's called industrial physics. And the idea is that uh, uh, we believe, uh, or the people in Argentina that said they study uh, plants, they believe that uh, industry is behind academia in terms of methods and in terms of abstraction level and you know all these kind of things we already know that uh, industry tend to be very conservative of the kind of methods they use so they think we need professionals in the environment that uh, kind of bridge academia and industry and uh, so in that context I did my master thesis uh, in an industry that builds uh, pipes out of a solid uh, so they build the solid cylinders of a uh, steel and then they form that into pipes. And within that thing, I did non-destructive testing using some uh, electromagnetic simulations uh, to detect cracks inside the, the pipes that are formed, but we also make some studies on how to optimally heat up these uh, cylinders uh, to get maximum performance of the drilling process that will make the, uh, the pipes at the end. And after that, I kind of, yeah, it's nice to work in the industry, it's nice to work with industry, but I found it not so nice to work in industry. <laughs> um, so I moved, I, I decided to make a, um, a PhD, and I was searching for something that is related to nonlinear dynamical systems and numerics and, you know, nonlinear systems mainly. And I found that uh, there is this area of robotics and AI mixed together. It's called embodied AI, where people deal with machines that are built to um, minimize the amount of digital control to achieve the desired behavior. Kind of like a control plus nonlinear plant optimization altogether. And so it's a very challenging and very interesting field of research. It's very uh, in its earliest stage still. So there we work with some uh, different platforms, robots if you want to call them, but they were really experimental platforms. We have mainly these walking robots, walking and jumping robots. That's an open design. It's out there in GitHub. If you want to build it yourself, it's meant to be controlled by an Arduino. Um, and then we have also this kind of fish that we had in this water tunnel, and we wanted to maximize a thrust a generated by the, the device, which is completely passive. So it's hanging here from a uh, um, beam, and then it has a motor that moves a central plate in a sinusoidal way, so nothing controlled there. And then you can adjust the elasticity of the body to optimize your resonance uh, to generate thrust. And this is inspired by some behavior that is observed in trouts. It's a very interesting uh, result. If you put dead trouts in water where there are vortices, they swim, although they are dead. Um, and so this led to several uh, studies uh, where they put electrodes on the muscles of the trout and then what they realized essentially is somehow the body of the trout is tuned to Karman streets on the rivers and they can exploit the energy on the vortices to reduce the amount of work they have to do to actually swim. Indeed, trout spend most of their life waiting behind a rock for food to come and then they go out and come. So they are very good at doing this kind of stroke behavior, but when they are steady waiting for food, they don't want to be thinking you know, much. So they are kind of optimized to stay there without actually doing anything. So people measure in dead and live trouts the activity of the muscles, and when they beha go behind the rocks or behind the obstacles, basically neural activity goes to see. They don't control the body, and the body takes care of you know swimming there, completely passive or very passively. And kind of the brain just controls for perturbances. Uh, so that we were trying to embed that into swimming robots to reduce the amount of energy they need to swim, and um, yeah, we got something. But uh, I don't know what the current state of this is. 2012. Um, then we did similar ideas with octopus. There is this big European project about uh, flexible or soft robots, they call it. So how you control basically a system that is floppy 
and how you sensor it, how you build models for it. So we make some very rough modeling to be able to control the curvature of these tentacles. Um, then we did modeling for a uh, running people or robots, simple models or fast models that can be used in the controllers uh, to get to achieve steady, stable, steady state running and walking. Not using C ZMP, if you know about robots, except for DARPA dynamic. Uh, Boston Dynamics, all the other walking robots, they use ZMP to walk, and it's a very non-natural way of controlling walking robots. So the more biologically inspired robots use this kind of methods called sleep models. Um, okay, then I will not go into this for everything. We also work with some Bibles and borrowing behavior, human reaching controller uh, games, where again the idea is there are many games that will profit from some sort of simulation running, like if you know games, you have SimCity or um, games like you know games that are not super fast and they kind of simulate environments in a complex way. Um, and the idea is okay, how can we bring uh, PDEs mainly to these games uh, without actually solving you know super complex uh, partial differential equations, but that still look realistic. And in this work. I did with a student, master student. The idea was to bring in shock waves into games. So if you throw a grenade, you know the grenade will explode and then destroy the environment accordingly. And this propagation was done using some kind of Boltzmann machine uh, on the on the game. And the difficult part was to couple the discrete solution of this Boltzmann machine into the real world. But anyway, so that's it. There. Then currently, indeed, yesterday the paper went up public. Uh, new technologies for uh, transistors to have a uh, computers let's say catch up with the death of uh, Moore's law uh, in terms of uh, computing power and the belief in the community is that uh, we need to forget about digital transistors and start thinking about analog transistors to get again into this uh, growth of uh, computing power uh, in a more or less exponential scale so the point is Mem transistors are too small, you cannot control the current anymore precisely. So if you want to keep adding transistors, the density of computing elements on a chip, you need to find a new technology. And we don't know what new technology is. And people talk about um, atom atomic switches or a atom shelter, I think it's called in, in German, and a one atom transistors. You have many names for it, but the idea is essentially you, we start using now analog properties of uh, metals and materials to do computation. And this mix up processing and memory into one element, and that's very interesting, very challenging, and is under development. I work also in ecology with some biologists and uh, climate analysis. So just what I want to say is that my background is very disciplinary. I have used the tool I'm going to present you in many different environments, and I never felt the need of using something else. I mean, I use a lot of tools, but uh, uh, Octave in particular. Um, so yeah, complex system, I would say, is my 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 area. Um, one of the points I always make when I talk about program is that knowing how to program to do uh, with being proficient in a particular language. So you can be an excellent programmer, and I know, but you don't know how to code a single line, okay? But nevertheless, you can come up with algorithms and you can even optimize algorithms without knowing how to program. Right? So, well, what I say is they know how to program, they just know, don't know the particular syntax of a language. So this is for me very always very important. Knowing how to program or programming knowledge is not the same as being proficient in a particular syntax or in a given tool. And that's why I don't have a tool that I prefer. I use whatever tool I find around that brings me faster to what I want to achieve. So if I'm going to discuss in particular Octave now, and the reasons why I think this is a very useful tool for some things, but I've also used Julia, NetLogo, if I'm more into uh, agent-based modeling. I use R, if it's heavy statistics, what I need to do. If you know something more web or you know interactive stuff, I would use Java. If I actually need to go into um, functional programming, I use Haskell, I've used other languages. 
so far I never actually found a need where yes this we have to do with functional programming but I know there are situations just it's not situations I usually go into uh, my preferred tool to go low level and high performance is C++ but I use C, Fortran um, throw me another low level language that uh, Delphi uh, I don't know yes because my point is once you know how to program the other thing is just learning syntax uh, we, uh, and it's, it doesn't take you a week to learn a syntax then of course things you become proficient that you can do these things very fast but to program something in any of these languages is not a uh, it's not the challenge. Coding coding is not the challenge. The challenge is knowing how to state an algorithm. Okay, Python, I have to mention it. I use it a lot for data processing and for creating for rapid prototyping, etc. But today I'm going to talk about Octave. And um, why do I use Octave? Basically, let's say what Octave is for. It's a high level language that means it's interpreted. So the um, data types that you use are automatically detected by the way you use them. Um, for example, if you want to store a number into a variable, the first thing is a double, but uh, of course you can make operations that will make the interpreter think it's an integer or it's a Boolean variable. It depends what you do with this variable. They will infer uh, what kind of data types I could store it in. By default, everything is a double. Um, and it's very important to highlight that this language and its uh, commercial counterpart, MATLAB, are meant for numerical computations. From its very beginning, you will notice here, Octave is slightly older than MATLAB. The two developers are originally highly connected, uh, the original owner of the co core MATLAB interpreter, and uh, John W. Eaton, which is the creator of Octave. And um, he's been developing Octave since 1988, till now, still very active development. And, um, and I highlight it's intended for numerical computations. And what that basically means, linear algebra. So if you have a problem, or if you read a paper, or you have some expression that you naturally write mathematically something like this. So here we have a transpose of a matrix multiplied by the matrix itself. We add some, we want to invert that matrix and then multiply by again a transpose times a vector. This is basically a regression solution, linear least squares regression uh, with a regularization. Um, something like this, I want to have a language that if I read it one line of a paper or one line of a book, I want to have one line of a program where I can test, okay, how this looks like, right? So if we assume that we somehow know what A has and I store it in a variable called A, so it's a matrix, this line of the program of the, sorry, paper or book becomes this line of the program of my code. And this is what I like about Octave slash MATLAB is that math that looks like this is basically transformed in the same thing, just, you know, change a little bit the symbols around. But it looks one to one. If you have experience with C++, for example, you know this is not the case. You can still express this in a very efficient way, but things will not look so similar. Right? And you say, wait, this is, what, what's the relevance of this? Well, I like it like this because I don't have to spend a lot of work reading this and writing the code or the other way around, reading my old code and understand what I was trying to do. So it's this ability to express mathematical formulas that I found very useful in Octave. Um, <clears throat> of course, so okay, here are some of the uses and features of Octaves. It's used a lot for that analysis, simulations with differential ordinary, uh, dif with differential equations or other kind of uh, models, discrete models uh, for optimization, nonlinear optimization. You can do object-oriented programming. You can do some kind of lambda, so a functional um, kind of programming using function handles, so pointers to functions. Uh, there is a huge amount of packages that extend functionality or implement a particular abstraction of a given domain. And uh, what you can do, but you shouldn't be doing, so here we go back to the first slide, if you find yourself writing MATLAB or Octave code to do any of this thing here, you probably are using the wrong tool. Okay, so in particular I've seen many students trying to do symbolic algebra. Of course there is a package in Octave to do symbolic algebra. But the point is, you shouldn't do it. 
because the language was not meant for that. Um, so you can choose any other language that is good at doing that and do it there. Um, unless, of course, you say, well, you need to solve uh, some stupid uh, symbolic thing that you could do in pen, pen and pencil, but yeah, you want to do it in your program. Uh, yeah, you can do it there. It will work, you know, Taylor expansion, stuff like that. You can do it. It will work fine. But if you're actually doing like heavy symbolic algebra, you, this is not the tool. You should choose another tool. And, and you will see it not only in the performance of your program, but how horrible the code looks like. Okay, so how unnatural these operations you want to do represent in the particular syntax. Metaprogram, I did myself, so that means you write programs that write programs. Uh, I did myself, can be done, horrible. Okay, it can be done, I've done it, I can show you examples. It just looks horrible. Why? Because the syntax is not meant to do that. Uh, the performance is uh, low. And of course, there are packages that will give you the right abstraction, such that the code looks a little bit better. Still, the performance will be horrible. It's not optimized to do that. Um, advanced string processing, something that you can do very efficiently with Python, is not efficient in Octave. Okay? It's not meant to process strings. Although strings are numbers and are integers, there are some operations you want to do there, substitution, search, etc., that doesn't have the correct uh, algorithms of data structure representation, so it's not efficient. Doesn't mean we cannot make it efficient. No? Somebody really caring, oh, I want to do string processing with Octave, can go and code your own um, data types to do this properly. But uh, maybe there is no need for it. Um, you can use other languages. File system manipulations, also, you see it abused all the time. So that means you want to create folders, and then with some criteria, copy files, and then maybe format a, a disk or stuff like that, doing it in Octave. You can do it, right? You shouldn't be doing it. It's not meant for that. And you shouldn't be doing it also with Excel or any other weird language uh, that is not meant to do it. And again, functional programming you can do some, but it's not meant to do it. The code usually looks horrible. I can give you examples again. So it's really hard to try showcase what you can do with Octave. Or maybe I should ask, who uses MATLAB or Octave? in their work or have used uh, MATLAB and Active in the past. Okay, so basically everybody except three people. So um, there are things that are very nice to do there and some other things that you, though, though you can still do, you know there are better tools to do this stuff. Okay, that's essentially this slide. If you want to see all the type of uses or many examples of uses of Octave, you can go to the wiki in Octave. There is a list of publications. It's not updated. We do this update every uh, Octave conference, so once a year. Uh, so you have only publications till 2017. Hopefully, uh, in March, when we have a Octave conference, uh, this will be updated yet again. Um, the list is quite comprehensive. There's a lot of publications using Octave. Um, sadly, some of these publications cite MATLAB and not Octave, so there is an issue of visibility we're going to discuss um, later on. Okay, so there are, of course, missing features, and you can check what's there. So if you think you want to help encode your own things, and you can even, if you're a student, you can even get money to improve these things. And essentially, we use the Summer of Code programs from Octave and from the European Space Agency to enroll students to you know, help us developing Octave. So already from the language, you may guess already, I'm an active Octave developer, yes? But I don't want to sell you Octave. I just want to tell you what Octave I think is good for and what is not good for. Um, so this is my I've done in Octave. Of course, you know, data fitting, modeling, smoothing, uncertainty quantification, all these kind of things you can do and you can visualize. Uh, this is a similar example. We have some data, we fit some model to it, but we have some uh, other models that would also fit the data. We can represent that uncertainty there. We can do uh, take measurements of the terrain and then fit a terrain and then visualize it. Uh, you can visualize it 3D like this. You can also visualize things in a control plot. You know, Plotting, visualizing data, and um, doing data analysis is something I would say is the core use of um, this language. Another use, very practical, is 
dynamical systems, especially low dimensional ones, where low dimensional maybe a couple of thousand states. Uh, and uh, here I just show you a concrete example of the language. This is a full program, you can run it, you will get this plot here. And essentially what I do is first, so I'm going to encode this dynamical system here, it's called the Van der Poel oscillator. Uh, these are time derivatives, so these are rate of changes of two variables, I, I, uh, y1 and y2. And um, the second variable, the rate of change is a nonlinear function. You see here we have a square and we have a cross product within these two guys. And uh, this system has this property that it doesn't matter essentially where you start, after a while you will converge into this uh, limit cycle, this orbit there. It's an attractive orbit on the space. So if you start from inside this uh, trajectory, you will you know, go around and then reach there and then stay there forever. And if you're outside, you will be quickly attracted to it and stay there also oscillating. So how we simulate this? In this, how we reproduce this plot here? First, we choose how many lines we want to have, 15 in this case. I distribute it in a logarithmic space because I know there is a logarithmic relation here, so that gives me this kind of uniform spacing on this space. You can also do a linear. So this means distribute in a logarithmic way points that start from 10 to the power of minus 2 to the logarithm of 5, so basically to 5, and uh, 15 times. So this you see here goes from some very small number, 0 0.01, somewhere there, and it goes to 5. Right? So this, I'm getting the initial conditions here. The initial condition for the velocity or for the second component of this system, I put it down to 0. These are n zeros. And then I define the dynamical system. The dynamical system is defined here in a very particular way, which we can discuss. I'm just using here some slicing, clever slicing, to get many solutions solved in one shot. But essentially here I'm saying I2, this guy that is here. Here is 1 minus I1, uh, upsilon, uh, sorry, Y1 squared times Y2 minus Y1. So it's this equation here. Except for the slicing, I may have chosen a better way of keeping this slice similar to this thing. Uh, this is the equation, and then I set some tolerances for the integrators, called OD45, integrate these things, plot the lines, and then arrange the axis. Uh, so these typical things you can do with Optic, and in my experience, for example, I'm reading a paper. Some colleague told me, okay, yeah, I'm reading this paper about kinematic equations, and the, uh, the differential equations are very complicated, and understand them then usually my answer comes in this shape. I take the paper, look at the equations, implement it in Octave, and in 10, 20 lines, they can run and now play around with the system and maybe understand it better, and you know help them understand what the things are stated in the publication. So rapid prototyping, rapid um, learning and studying of um, things that are mathematical, something that is very easy to do in Octave. We could go say, well, Python is better. I would say, yes, Python is better in many aspects, but not in this one. So to represent the same thing, even using libraries that abstract, they provide the right abstraction, the code in Python is not that clean. It doesn't represent so directly what I actually want to study. The distance between code and the mathematical logic I want to study is higher, is bigger. Right? You can still do it. You can do it faster. Yes, but here the optimality criteria for me is how easy it is to go from the math to the code and vice, vice versa. Okay. Um, again, the Python code will look very similar, but there will be some class definitions on top, and then this handle here will have to be a lambda function, or I will have to define a, a function myself, so it won't be so clean. Okay. Just that. Um, Okay, what you can do with this, you can do other stuff, uh, you know, biochemical reactions, what I mentioned is something that the environmental engineers ask me a lot, oh, I don't understand this paper, can you help me reading, and my answer is just run this program, you know, understand it yourself, explore the solutions of the, because sometimes this is what they need, is basically the math is complicated, it's also complicated for me, I don't know what these equations will give. So you put it into a program and then you can study it and try around, you know, check the theorems that maybe they prove on the paper. 
And you want to do this quickly. You want to spend a week programming this paper in, in, in a language because uh, you just want to do a quick test, right? To, to understand the paper, to even decide if this paper is relevant for you or not. Um, this case, this is for uh, water engineers. There was this discussion that uh, how much will the noise on rain propagate to different tanks. And essentially what we have here is this tank is receiving water from outside in this kind of, uh, they would call it a yetograph. So this is rain intensity as a function of time, these uh, bars pointing down. So the longer this bar, the more rain is falling at that moment in time. And all this rain goes into this first tank. Okay, but this tank is connected through the other tanks with uh, what's called non-steady Bernoulli equations. And um, so what you see is how this, of course, the level of the first tank will oscillate very closely to the rain. And then the other ones will kind of be filtering this behavior. And the wider you go, the more, you know, kind of integrating and taking the mean value of that thing. By the way, this movie is made in Octave also, so you can make this kind of movies. Um, you can integrate dynamical systems that come from mechanics, like kinematic chains and these kind of things. What it is in the with all these robots I mentioned before is mainly that. Um, and again, the point is not efficiency, although you can be quite efficient. Uh, it's not flexibility. The point is how quickly I can myself explore some ideas that are published out there and I, how quickly I can start communicating with people that may not share the knowledge I have about, for example, models. Right? And how easy is this code so that they were already scared by the mathematics of the publication. I don't want to give them a code that scares them too. Right? So I want to give them a look, it's very simple. Right? So um, if I give them Python code, for example, it's usually scary because it's more declarative, more definitive. If I give them C++ code, of course, you know, they will say, thank you very much, goodbye. Um, but I found that with Octave, because although not efficient, although not flexible, allows to make this very clear mapping between what is written in the paper and the code you get, people like it. And this is the, one of the biggest reasons why MATLAB is so successful among the engineers. Um, OK, packages. So I told you that you can extend Octave for a, a specific uh, Applications. This is the official repository of packages in Octave. So the community of Octave, a repository where there are packages that, let's say, achieve certain level of quality, and we use the space in the cloud that we pay for uh, to store them and to keep the um, documentation, etc. And there are plenty of them. I don't know how many we have currently, and there are much, much more. Just that we don't host them. So there are many projects that have their own hosting in GitHub, in you know, in user pages of the universities, stuff like there's plenty of things done. Sometimes it's called for MATLAB, but it actually runs in Octave as well. And um yeah, so you can just go there and look if you're searching for a particular application, what you want to do. Um Again, you may seem somewhere there symbolic, so maybe S, S, uh, okay, that just below here maybe, but we have a symbolic package, right? You can do symbolic manipulation. You go get the right abstractions, it doesn't mean you're going to be more efficient or, you know, the code will be cleaner, it's just that you can do this in less line, in fewer lines of code. Um, this is just encoding domain specific abstractions. Still doesn't mean it will be efficient. It may not be good for Octave or MATLAB. Um, yes, I think that's what's the point. Okay, what packages? Why are packages there? The idea is that you can share. Let's say you have your cousin that lives in uh, Valis and you work here in Rappersville, so. Um, you could send them emails with the different versions of the code, et cetera, et cetera, and try to or make sure that he's putting the files in the right place, you know, all these kind of things. Or you can put your M files or M files that you are generating with your language, you know, your program in a folder called inst. Then maybe if you don't trust, you know, if you don't know what kind of ethical behavior your cousin has, you can make explicit how you, he should cite your work. Um, you put a description of what this code does, 
and then you also give him a license so he knows what he can do with this code like for example you know don't give it to this person or whatever you put it here in the copying file and then you just zip this thing you send it over mail to uh, your friend or your cousin and then he will start octave run this line with your zip thing and this thing will install your functionality in his machine and if he had a previous version it will be overwritten and uh, he can enjoy the latest version of your package and then within Octave 1 he has installed it like this in every time he loads Octave he can do load the package my cousin sent me uh, you know use the files that are there for example here I'm just checking the help of this uh, language and then when I'm done I can unload it and remove it from the past or forget that I have it there so packages not only for uh, sharing uh, with the world it's also very helpful to share with your colleagues so to put things in package and allow them to load and unload compare different versions of code etc and if you put this on top of this uh, some kind of control version repository then you know things get really clean and really easy to maintain collaborative collaborative packages which is what we do here right? it's essentially that um, if you have questions just interrupt okay don't wait till the end just ask anything you want to know and um, just go ahead okay again as I say giving a full showcase of Octave in an hour it doesn't make any sense there are some reference here of a uh, places where you can go and get more information to search effectively if Octave is something you, you may need and um, you have the online manual you have the wiki which is you know less structured than the manual but has more information uh, there is a mailing list that is quite active and people are usually very friendly it's a multilingual mailing list so if you ask in German or in Spanish Italian and if there is somebody understanding the language you will get an answer um, there is also a G plus community if you prefer that platform if you are old style like we are you can use a IRC channel there it's quite active also uh, you can find some of us in Twitter this is John W Eaton the original developer this is me and there are some other guys um, I'm gonna talk now a little bit about free software so to advance on that there are many ways of supporting here are many examples of what you could do essentially means you can give us your time and uh, making clear that money is maybe time but not always right because you can give us here no money but your time <laughs> and we're happy but of course donations or monetary donations are also good uh, you can give money if you cannot give time um, so now we shift a little bit into a more global scope where we talk about what I usually tend to say libre software not to confuse it with free in terms of gratis okay and usually the acronyms you will see is free libre open source software or free open source software I prefer always libre to make it clear that is nothing to do about gratis or cost okay that libre or free doesn't mean it doesn't mean it doesn't cost what I just told you is there is a lot of time invested in this kind of thing so there is a cost associated with it and um, it would be great if we can uh, recover that in some way before besides altruism uh, satisfaction right so here is a table that I got from um, the guy who uh, runs all the open or libre software project in CERN and he I think it's make it very clear so we have two kind of license in software one is called proprietary that means you get my software and you have no rights on it okay but to use it you can just use it and then you have libre which basically means you can do whatever you want with it at different levels of what whatever you want with it and now in a completely independent axis we have the aims of that software we could be commercial it means I want to make money with this software and could be non-commercial I don't care if I make money with that um, software so proprietary commercial is the usual software you know especially if you are running Windows or Mac platforms this is your usual software stuff people sometimes confuse libre software with freeware 
which is software you can download for free. You don't get the code, you just get an executable, so it doesn't cost you money to use this software, but still you gain no rights on that thing that you were given, okay? That's called freeware. Uh, many apps in Android are freeware. So you get the app, you can use it for free, but uh, you don't have any right to modify it, redistribute it, or reverse engineer it, or whatever, something, it's all illegal, okay? Just can use it for free. Um, Okay, then we go into the library or free software, free again, related with freedoms, not with no cost. And currently, not, but I would say the biggest mass of a uh, free library open source software is in the realm of non-commercial. So people don't want or can't do money with software that g gives freedom to users, okay? Freedom to modify, copy, learn, uh, do basically own the code. But here is where essentially we need to develop new business models that are not, uh, you know, the current ones, which basically, so if you want to use the knowledge or let's say the successful business models here, you will fail and uh, you will basically slowly drift into this thing. So you will start saying, oh yes, I give you the core of my thing for free, libre, but then all these applications, you will have to pay for them. And you are, once you get these applications, this is not libre anymore. So you, you, you lose your rights here. Um, so this is standard way people have managed to do something there. But here, essentially, what we need or what we lack is creativity in, in thinking how we can, you know, compatibilize freedom of the user and me recovering the costs I put in creating this piece of software. If you want to know more about this problem and how many companies have been solving it, I recommend this uh, book made with Creative Commons. It's basically, um, I think it's 10 companies that are uh, libre and they are still, and they are making money. And also some discussions about why it would be good to really get things run here, especially from an environmental perspective. Um, consumption perspective there are several items that are not related with software directly so if you have time to read something I recommend this book um, and now I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios why I choose or why slowly I drifted into um, free software so first I was a student so I was a student in Argentina this is me trying to or trying to learn for a quantum mechanics examination and um at that time, uh, I knew basically Windows, and I knew the programs that I can get in Windows, like Origin, Maple, I don't remember anymore what names I had, but basically I had all this chunk of software, each one giving me some functionality, but essentially what I wanted to do is a combination of those things. So I wanted to have Maple to solve some equations, and then put this into Origin to fit some data, for example, right? Um, and it was not easy to do it. You will have to hack around in a very ugly way. It will not be portable. You know, it will work for one version, not for the other one. Um, if you contact the company, they will basically say, "Yeah, oh, this is very interesting. Who are you?" And say, "I'm a student." I will, they will not answer anymore. Okay, uh, you are not a client for them. Um, the other problem I was running is, you know, I come from a country that is a low-income country, uh, so we. I was running basically in old hardware, and then they would tell, ah, oh, the new version only runs, so I had, let's say, Windows 3.11, I think, I don't remember what was it, and they said, oh, this one only runs in Windows NT. Uh, I cannot install Windows NT in my computer. Well, you can use, not use the software anymore. So, but, uh, but I have all these things that uh, I need to run. I'm sorry, buy a new computer. I can't. No, my problem, right? So this situation, maybe not very relevant for Switzerland, was very real for me. Um, the other thing is, I want to do this crazy stuff. You know, as a student, I read this, ah, oh, yeah, I will change the world by doing this. How can I use this software to help me do that? <clears throat> and what I had a lot is uh, that you spend time, this is what I told you, like, for example, to try to couple Maple and Origin. So I spend you spend time, you know, building these bad files to call one thing, pass the argument, invent some kind of txt file that to, you will use to parse and then build equations you spend a lot of time and the reuse is zero 
either change the version, change the operating system, give it to somebody else, it will not work. So you basically wasted, not spend, but wasted your time doing that. At some point, somebody tell me, well, what you want to do is very easy in Linux, try it out. So I uh, installed my first SUSE uh, version, and then I went into Paradise, because I realized here is the right environment to work. So that was just a Linux. And at that time, I was trying to try to get, I don't know how I get Origin to run in Linux. I you know, tried to bring these tools I had in Windows into Linux. Uh, and then people say, well, you don't need to do that, because we have all these tools already developed. They may be not so polished, not so money behind them, so much money behind them, but, but you can do it. So and basically, this thing here, this is Maxima. If you know, it's a computer algebra system. Uh, at that time, it really saved a lot of time in my studies of quantum mechanics. Um, nowadays, I use Sage. Um, and when I do teach, I usually use GeoGebra. And that analysis, I use Octave. And you can combine these things very, very easily. Uh, and if you do it once correctly, it's portable. So this, some of the scripts that I still use were written in 2004, and I'm still using them. So that's like more than 10 years of life to the code. So I don't need to reinvest to redo. Maybe I need to fix some things on the compiler, stuff like that. But I really have all code, my own code, running today. I have also, for example, Berlet uh, integration for molecular dynamics. It's the same code I wrote when I took the classes in 2001. Right? So that's uh, 17 years old code, still running, still working. I challenge you to take 17 old year Word files and read them in nowadays doc. Okay, just challenge you. Try to do it. Or Lotus one two three read with the Excel. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, so that was scenario one, a student, you know, you have time, you want to do all this crazy stuff. For me, free software, libre software was the solution. I could start doing all this stuff. Uh, I didn't have much budget, a lot of budget, but I had a lot of time to do it. Then I became a researcher, well, I think so. And here what I realized, okay, now my work kind of combines with the uh, demands or I can combine work with my work. So it became platform where I can share to increase collaboration, citations, uh, you know, grow a network of collaborators. Um, again, it became the natural platform to do this, Libre software, because it not only gives, again, reuse, uh, reusability to your code, but it's portable. So you can use this, you know, if the program we are using can be compiled for Windows, Mac, whatever, my code that I produce in one OS can be used in the other OS. And um, yeah, some of the things that are very important in this thing is sometimes you want to understand algorithms that are implemented in some successful uh, software. So you want to be able to, you want to be allowed to look into the code to see how, how do you do this stuff, for example. And this sadly I have found, oh, they gave me this great simulator of robots. So robotic simulation, fantastic one. And then you start noting some weird behavior in corner case situations, okay? Like uh, you put a system that it should be unstable, but when you simulate it, it's quite stable. And say, well, something is weird here. So I would like to do to look what we are doing to know if this is actually something I want to have or not in my simulations. So if you're not allowed to look at the code, you cannot do it. That's a starter. But then what about if I find out that you're doing something that I don't want, now I want to remove it, right? And of course, you show me the code, I can do it. I may try to recompile. That's usually if the people that sell me the software did not think that I will change their code and recompile, it's usually it's very hard to do because I will need tools that they don't tell I need. It's very hard to recompile this thing. But let's say you manage to recompile it, now you're doing something that's illegal. So if they know about it, Maybe they are friendly about you and say, well, yeah, but you shouldn't do this. Or they can sue you, the university you are working for, or your employer, okay? So, and the point was here is, look, your product is not what I need. It's partly what I need. So I just wouldn't like to fix this stuff. And uh, you may tell the guys, well, why don't you fix it in your mainstream? Then they will say, well, you know, you are one person that wants this. We will not do it for you. We will not make a full new product to satisfy your needs, right? 
if you make kind of a critical mass of users needing this, then maybe we'll consider it. But yeah, you know, it means energy will have to collect people, and for what? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, this line here, understanding the algorithms and understand what they do, is very, very, very relevant. You want to try crazy ideas, so you want to test variations on algorithms that are already there, and you want to customize because of the things we did before. Not all your colleagues will have the same kind of knowledge, so you may want to present some kind of code to some of them, some kind of other kind of code to other people. Um, and yeah, reproducibility in science is very important. Then I use this software, let's say console, to make my simulations, and I got these great results. Then the only ones who will be able to reproduce those, that means get exactly the same numbers on the simulations, will be those who have access to console, which is kind of like 10% of the world population. And um, not to mention, you know, give a quick start and start modifying from the point you left, which is a basic idea of scientific collaboration is I made some advances, you don't have to climb the hill again because I already did it, so now you can continue from where I stopped. Proprietary software usually does not allow you to do this in an easy way. You basically will have to re-implement somewhere, so you have to climb the hill once again. Um, so now from an interpreter point of view, so I'm a little company, especially CAMUs or a small, medium enterprises, SME. Um, why would I want free software or libre software? So here what we have is that, I mean, as a small company, software development, unless that's exactly your business point, it can be very costly and you may not be able to invest a lot of time doing that, but you have good budget and you take the decisions. Okay, you are the owner of what you do. So what you can do is tertiarize or cope, kind of like join communities, online communities, and exploit their development and power to get what you actually want. What you actually want is similar to what researchers want. So you want to have a scalability of your uh, business. Basically, if you have more clients, you will not need to have more programs. Um, so your cost should not grow with the number of clients you have, basically. It should maybe go the opposite. Um, you want to customize, you want to provide for different clients the solution they actually need, not the solution a particular software developer decided is what you need to, to give. Uh, I give an anecdote now, yes, I have time, um, about transparency and auditability, that you may think why is this important, well, it depends on where your business is, it can be very, very important. And uh, portability, especially operating system portability, so you want to be able to have the freedom to uh, move this tool you are used to any particular operating system you may decide to use at a given point in time. I have also an anecdote on this for a small company, uh, for a very stupid system that was an um, address management system, okay? Uh, just, yeah. If you are interested in knowing this anecdote, we can take And most importantly, as a small company, you don't want to lose your freedom. So you always want to keep your ability to take decisions and not run into extra cost because you took a decision that is not aligned with what your providers want to do. Okay, so you want to keep your freedom. Um, so before we move into the anecdote, which is a canton and an engineer uh, office, um, there is this myth in people who have not experienced Libre software. If they pay for a particular software, then if something goes bad, they will be able to sue or to demand something from the company that sold them the software. This is a myth. And this myth is built, I don't know around what, but essentially it's very easy to just read the disclaimer on the license. When you bought your software, there will be something written in bold letters, capital, that would say, if something goes straight, it's your fault, not us. Right? Again, I don't know if all the software, ha all proprietary software has that, but at least I don't know any proprietary software that doesn't have it. So software companies will not be liable if the software does something wrong. Okay? And probably if you want them to be liable, you will have to pay a lot of money to cover the risk of uh, demand, basically. So I don't know, you may give me some examples on the contrary, any software, proprietary software, commercial product, 
that takes responsibility on the bugs of their software. Okay, so there is no warranty that the software will actually work correctly, or if you run into a problem, like let's say you design a bridge with using a Pipirupu software, the bridge collapses, and they say, oh, but it was Pipirupu software that did it wrong. No company will take this kind of liability, okay? It's your fault. Um, and essentially to, to move this is every time you have a software at hand, you know, maybe if you're using a commercial software, just go and check the disclaimer, which should be on top of the license, which basically will say this, we are not liable. And then also there is another thing together with the license, which is the terms of use, and usually it reads like this, all your bases belong to us. <laughs> so what is in the terms of use is if you touch my program, everything that I see is mine and not you anymore. Okay? It sounds crazy what I'm saying, but just go and read the terms of use and it's what it says. For example, many of these programs will give you online interfaces and they will say if you use these online interfaces, everything you put here belongs to us. Oh, but I wrote this code, I don't care. It belongs to me because you accepted the terms of use, okay? It sounds crazy, but please go and read the terms of use because that's what it says there, okay? <laughs> um, so these kind of things, it, I don't know who wants it. I think people just don't know that they are g doing this. So it's a good practice to start reading these kind of things and start realizing what actually are the advantages of working with a proprietary software. Um, okay, so let's go for the anecdote. So I have no not so many slides left. Um, so there is this canton in Switzerland who have been for many years making um, an assessment of uh, the um, life infrastructure, okay? So they have some infrastructure that's critical for the uh, functioning of the canton. And um, every year they have hired this uh, engineer bureau to do the calculations and make the report. And um, the guys give them a report. So paper thing, a PDF that says um, the numbers. Basically, yes, this will uh, you know you can use it for ten more years, and this is the money you should be saving to in case it breaks. You know all these kind of calculations. Uh, they call it um, um, yeah, doesn't matter. Basically, you want to know how much money you want to save in case some of your things break, and how long you expect these things will last before they break, okay? And um, so they were getting back this uh, report and they were happy until some other engineers told you, but how do you know these numbers are correct? And then the canton went back, how we know these numbers are correct? And they say, oh, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, this guy says so, they are the experts, right? So the canton went back and said, how are you doing these calculations, right? And the guy said, well, we are using this software. And what is this software doing? Uh -huh. I don't know. It's using this formula, you know, names, no references, no scientific backtrackability. So you actually have a program, you put some numbers in, you get some numbers out, and you trust these numbers are the ones you want. And, um, and of course, this is a little bit simplified story, but there is more in-depth really trying to find out what the software was doing, and it was very hard to do it. So you cannot track back. So you cannot audit where these numbers come from, okay? So what you actually need here is the simple solution is, A, show me the source code. And these guys couldn't, because they don't have the right or they don't have had the code. So basically what the customer say, well, we will not work anymore with you, we will work with the other engineer company that offers all the things we need, so they give you the report and they give you a Python script when they, re they show us how they get these numbers, right? And then we, they have a documentation where we read, okay, uh, to do this number, we're using this formula, Wikipedia link or a, a link to a book. And, you know, you see the code here, it's written down, check if there is any bug. So the point is that a canton with a money which is about uh, 20,000 Swiss francs a year, choose for clear reasons, auditability, a company that was working with free software just because it was very easy to make an audit on these numbers and this report, right? And for the company itself, it costs no extra. For the previous company, to make this audit will represent a huge cost, and they will have to start writing manuals and, you know, the description of all this software and what the software is doing, etc., etc. 
So the huge cost, while the company using Libre software, they don't have to do it because everything is done. And you know, you give to your client your the code and say, look, check if this is what you want or not. We can change it for you. Somebody else can change it for you. Um, and so I think that case is trust was built because the Canton, this office on the Canton. Now they look at this company and say, essentially, what you are giving us, what we are paying for is trust. Because we can trust on what you are giving us, and if we don't like the way you do it, we can take these things you give us and give it to somebody else. So we stay with you because we trust you. We think you are the best guy to do this stuff, although we can go to somebody else. Okay. So if you get this kind of clients as a small company, you are done, right? because you have very loyal clients. Right? And of course, it's harder because you have to keep this uh, um, thing running, you know, you have to always show that you are the best to do the thing and, you know, it's, they could at any point take this software and give it to somebody else and say, okay, do it you. Um, but I think it's a more healthy relationship between client and small company. This is my view on why small companies should be using Libre software. There are more reasons and experiences. Um, so again, in brief, Longevity of your code, me as a person, that's very important. I don't want to be recording every three years or, you know, changing configurations in a, in small things. Yes, I'm okay with that, but, you know, structural things, not. Um, sharing, increasing the visibility. I want people to use the things I do and know that I did it uh, to have some kind of impact, you know, change the way things are done. Uh, I want to be able to extend behaviors and uh, programs. I want to be easy to maintain. I want to be part of a community. That's also for me important. You know, it gives you, it's very healthy if you interact with other people that have similar interests and, you know, you get this kind of, it's like doing sports, right? It's team sports. Um, and other things that are more maybe for the private sector, you want to keep your independence, it's very important. Avoid vendor lock ins. For the public sector, and this is sadly reality, you don't. If a company is profiting from the public sector, from tax money, it should be clear that they're doing that. So essentially, if big part of the budget of a company comes from money that is public, this should be clear to everybody. Look, this company is surviving thanks to this taxpayer's money. When we have public institutions using proprietary software that ask you for a renewal of the license every year, and these persons are trapped into these programs because either they don't want to do anything else, they don't, cannot use any other tool, or because they think there is no other tool, essentially what we have is a subsidy. Right? This company will receive every year money from universities and stuff like that, not because the universities are choosing to do that, because they don't have any other option. And you may think, oh, this is a very weird situation. It's reality. Look at what happened with England and Windows XP. I don't know if you have heard this news, but essentially the public sector of England and many other countries we're running in Windows XP, Windows XP expired, and they say, well, wait, you know, I have all my system running on this. I say, well, you know, we don't support anymore XP, so you have to move to Windows 10 or whatever was the next version. And this was a huge, massive effort for England, and they have to pay Microsoft an extra contract for to maintain support of Windows XP for an extra two years, I think. Huge amount of money. This is a subsidy. For Microsoft, right? Because they, the, the country cannot decide, no, we don't want this, right? Because they will stop working, essentially. So it's effectively a subsidy for Microsoft from a country, which is okay if the country decides to do it. Right? If we all agree, yes, we want to pay Microsoft so much money every year, we're all happy. But the problem is when we cannot do anything else but to pay this money. Um, okay, boosting com uh, customization, you know, adjust to your client needs, and of course, uh, capitalize, uh, have capitalization of developments in the society. All these arguments I've been done, I have been kind of moving around. You can ask, okay, is there something like Liber Data? Yes, there is. It's called Open Data, and I will let you to read about it. But you will find very similar arguments. Um, open data and open hardware have more kind of environmental reasons. So, to close, it doesn't matter what language uh, you use, 
you know, that's irrelevant. Use the tool that you think you're more efficient with, but try to keep it libre. There are many, many, many advantages on that. Even if you don't realize that yet, if you kind of think and try it out, you may be may find these advantages. It doesn't mean you don't have to use proprietary software. It means that you should keep your freedom open and always have an alternative that doesn't impose on you all the constraints. So um, following this presentation, there will be an Octave course. So if you actually want to learn how to use Octave and uh, you know get uh, training on it, um, we'll have a three days course, 7th, 21st, and 28th of March. Um, you can register here if you're interested. There is a, a kind of like a formal fee of 30 francs. We are able to have like about 15 people on the course. So yeah, first come, first serve. And uh, the first day is for people who don't know how to program. So we're going to make a very quick introduction how on programming, general programming, uh, using Octave as a support language. But it will be really about programming. So if you know already how to program, you don't need to enroll for the seven. Um, but then we'll have basic use of Octave and advanced use of Octave the other two days. So if you want to go deeper into the coding, uh, we can meet there again. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Five minutes overdue. OK, thank you. <laughs> Is there any question or comment? Did I say something wrong? <laughs>